my name is Natasha Heller, and I am a professor of Chinese religions at, at, in the Department of Religious Studies here at the University of Virginia. And I'm very happy to welcome you to the virtual experience of the East Asia Center uh, here at uh, UVA. And I am exceptionally pleased today to introduce Xiaowen Cheng, Professor of East Asian Religions in the Department of East Asian Languages and Civilizations at the University of Pennsylvania. She received a BA and MA in Chinese Language and Literature from National Taiwan University and her PhD in History from the University of Washington. She is an intellectual and cultural historian focusing on China from the 10th through the 13th century. Uh, and her research interests span gender and sexuality, medical history, religion, and anecdotal literature. She brings all of these inter interests together to brilliant effect in her divine, demonic, and disordered Women Without Men in Song Dynasty China, published by the University of Washington Press in 2021. Looking at writings from the Song Dynasty, Professor Chung examines how elite men tried to make sense of women who refused to submit their sexual bodies to men. The women Professor Chung considers were seen to suffer from uh, enchantments disorder, and some were said to have inter intercourse with ghosts. All of this makes for a fascinating reading that illuminates gender and sexuality in middle period China. Highly recommend that you read this book. Um, Professor Chung has published in journals such as Asian Medicine, Asia Major, uh, the Journal of Chinese Literature and Culture, and the Journal of Chinese Religions. She is currently at work on an edited volume on the cross-cultural exchange of medicine um, across Asia, and a new book project on concepts of norm and normalcy in pre-modern China. Today, she will be speaking on sexuality during this period, and her talk is titled Writing a History of Sexuality for Pre-Modern China, Some Methodological Reflections. Please join me in a warm welcome to Professor Chung. Thank you so much, Natasha. Thank you, Brian, for uh, organizing this and, uh, and uh, inviting me, and thank you for pushing me to um, to go to a direction that's uh, uh, a lot of things that I started to think about when I wrote the book, but uh, not included uh, in the book uh, um, at all. And uh, thank you everyone for coming to, to the lecture. Um, and I really look forward to, to um, hearing your, your uh, feedback because this really also is a work in progress. So let me share my screen. Uh, and, uh, if anything goes wrong uh, during the uh, the share screen presentation, please uh, uh, please speak speak up because I may not be able to see chat uh, during the screen sharing mode. All right, so um, my title today is "Writing a History of Sexuality for Premodern China: Some Methodological Reflections." Now, um, so I would I would do quite a lot of it is um, kind of literature review. Um, but I will also uh, discuss some examples uh, using primary sources and kind of uh, testing the, the possibilities here. So the two questions, two, set, two sets of questions as I uh, promised in the, uh, in the abstract of the talk uh, are, are, are the following. So the first one is, is really starting with the this, what have we been looking for? You know, when we when we set off set off writing a history of sexuality for for anywhere, you know, especially anywhere before the twentieth century, when uh, when we are encountering a very different world, where you know even the English word sex sexuality didn't mean the same uh, before the nineteenth century, and not to mention uh, anywhere else, such as pre modern China. What exactly have we been looking for? What do we decide? Uh, what is relevant? What is not? Is it is it just readily transparent? It's just um, you know, we know it, we know it's sex when we see it, or do we, do we second guess um, what exactly is this, this source really about? So, so I want, so um, I am uh, looking at several uh, scholarship and see what uh, each of the scholars are looking for when they uh, talk about uh, uh, sex culture, sex um, uh, history of sex sexuality in pre-modern China, and and uh, and uh, I have my um, my thoughts. So the first sense of question eventually leads to uh, the larger question that is why studying the history of sexuality, and 
the second uh, question, which is closely related, that is, uh, that is also what we constantly see. This is uh, oftentimes a question that that uh, that we wanted to answer uh, from the very beginning when we get into uh, writing a history of sexuality for uh, pretty much any non-Western world. That is, was this uh, culture different or similar from? Uh, say the West, or you know, even if uh, it's we don't use uh, the West as a reference point, uh, was pre-modern China, for example, different or similar from other cultures or societies that we uh, think we know better? So these uh, this question can lead to the larger question: is why uh, why comparative history is worth doing, and how? Uh, we can start doing it, especially uh, with a comparative history of sexuality. Now, uh, so I will start with the first question. What have we been looking for? I, uh, so when, uh, when looking for what we've been looking for, uh, I have three major observations, uh, especially in the uh, surveys or uh, introductory pieces of history of sexuality in pre-modern China. The first one is what I called uh, a kind of retrospective sexology. Uh, now we know sexology is a uh, unique late 19, early 20th century way of scientifically analyzing people's sexual practice and habits. Uh, it sets up standards to evaluate whether uh, a certain sexual practice is healthy, normal, or is it deviant, is it perverted, pathological, or uh, is it oppressed? Uh, I call it retrospective sexology when such an approach is applied to history. Uh, and the second observation that I have is uh, what I call a kind of censorship hypothesis. Uh, and I'll explain that. And the third one is uh, how we tend to take sex as a given. So I'll start to explain the first one, retrospective sexology. And it's probably the easiest to use uh, uh, Robert Hintz and Gulick as an example. Uh, by now, we all kind of recognize how he is a uh, heavily influenced by, uh, by his sexology. And uh, he was also called uh, uh, or labeled an Orientalist, criticized as an Orientalist uh, by, by scholars uh, for reasons I, I would also, I would not disagree. Uh, here, uh, I give you some uh, very interesting background of Van Gulik's works on sex in ancient China, which uh, is mainly relied on uh, the research done by Paul Golden and Leon Rocha. Some of those, because uh, I know every uh, synergist are, are uh, every synergist is, a is familiar with Van Gulik, but may not uh, really know those interesting uh, details. Um, so, uh, so he's the, the pioneer of uh, uh, pioneer scholar who uh, wrote uh, two major works on the history of sexuality of pre-modern China, the erratic prince of the Ming period sexual life in ancient China. And the, uh, the second book, uh, Sexual Life in Ancient China, was in fact a part of a uh, religious sexual life series, uh, which was published from the late uh, 1920s all the way uh, to the 60s. Uh, I'm not sure if that continued, but it started around that time. And uh, so before, uh, before Sexual Life in Ancient China, they also published Sexual life in ancient Rome, sexual life in ancient Greece, sexual life in ancient India, etc. So it's you know it's a part of that, those series. At first, uh, Rolich uh, went to Joseph Needham for this uh, this volume, and Joseph Needham recommended Van Gulik to do that. Uh, and he he wrote to so Needham wrote to John Carter, who is uh, one of the directors of Rolich saying that Chinese sexology, well, you see the keyword here, so I don't need to argue that uh, they are doing a kind of historical sexology. Uh, Chinese sexology was of an extreme healthy, humane, sorry, uh, typo humane and non-sadistic uh, character. 
comparing favorably with the sexual theory. And you see a comparison here, right? So you always have, so you have a comparison almost always there, comparing favorably with the sexual theory and practices of other Asian people and indeed with all other peoples in the world. Now, uh, and, um, and Van Gulik uh, shared that uh, vision. And actually Van Gulik didn't quite share uh, Ninham's uh, evaluation of, uh, of the sources that he sees, especially the, uh, the Ben Chamber Art Manuals. Uh, uh, initially, Van Gulik's view viewpoint of those are quite different from Joseph Ninham's, but he was convinced by Ninham, maybe because because he thinks Nikham is a more uh, legitimate uh, sinologist, so he was convinced. And uh, and in the uh, in the preface, he uh, uh, in the preface to sexual life in ancient China, Van Gogh says uh, here quote for writing that preface, I needed uh, some knowledge of ancient Chinese sexual life and habits. Uh, so this reference, this preface refers to the preference to erotic color prints of Ming period, the first uh, book on sexuality. Uh, uh, sexuality. Uh, he said, in my Chinese studies, I had till then always shirked uh, the subject because I felt that this was a field best left to a qualified sexologist. Um, especially since I had gathered from casual remarks in older and later Western books, on China that pathologia sexualis was largely represented there. Uh, I had to set right um, foreign misconceptions regarding sexual life in ancient China. Now, uh, so you see very uh, similar tones and similar approach and similar goals that uh, Joseph Nidham and uh, Arish Van Gulik are uh, trying to do. And um, there, are, there are many insightful critiques of Van Gulik's works that I won't repeat here, but the point that I wanted to make with uh, the rest of uh, the following several slides is that, uh, is that no, we don't tend, yes, we don't tend to make this kind of evaluation anymore. You rarely see people, uh, and of course you don't see people identifying what they do as sexology very much anymore among historians. And we, we also don't tend to see uh, people making this uh, judgment of, of uh, uh, sexual culture, sexual habits that they found in any history as, uh, as either healthy and normal or as perverted or uh, anything. No, we don't use that kind of evaluation anymore, but we still tend to think uh, that uh, people's sexual practice and habits are or are supposed to be the main subject matter for a history of sexuality. And this is, I think, what uh, current scholarship has in common with uh, Van Gulik's scholarship, even though we can recognize some of the things that we no longer uh, agree with. So, so the first example is uh, Brad Hinch's uh, book on uh, the male homosexual tradition in China. Uh, it's um, it's published a, a long a while ago, uh, and and it was a um, also a pioneering, very important uh, work on on uh, all the references, or a lot of the references to. Uh, uh, male same-sex relations uh, in traditional China. And in the introduction, uh, Brad Hinge recognizes the, the lack of evidence. Okay? So he says, in all periods, like you may outnumber uh, surviving records, making systematic uh, social history almost impossible. So <clears throat> rather than study people, I have been forced to concentrate on uh, the homosexual tradition itself. And by the homosexual tradition, he means uh, the tradition of writing about sex between men. So, um, so in his observation, there's a continuous tradition that people continue to write about uh, sex between men, although we don't know if there is a continuous practice uh, in Chinese history. Uh, so, but the, the assumption here is that 
we wish we have evidence that tells us what people actually do. And we wish we have evidence that, that, that tells us the, um, the so-called social history that tells us people's sexual lives, people's sexual practices, people's habits. Um, in other words, we, we wish that we have the raw material that we can do something like a sexology or a sexual ethnography. So although, although, and if we, if, uh, you know, when I keep reading the, uh, the introduction, although from the very beginning, uh, he recognizes uh, the lack of evidence. Uh, he quickly kind of falls back uh, into a, you know, what I would call a retrospective sexual ethnography. That is in the first paragraph that I cite here, he's, he's looking for uh, the, uh, the physical forms of, of uh, uh, male homosexual uh, practice in the written sources. He says on the physical level, surviving literature depicts anal intercourse as the preferred form of homosexual intercourse. Among the references to homosexuality that mention explicit sexual positions, anal intercourse is the most common by far. References to mutual masturbation uh, da, 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 are relatively rare. Now, there's no obvious mistake here. He's telling us what he finds in the sources. Uh, but, um, and then uh, he, also, he also uses uh, David Greenberg's uh, typology, which uh, puts social expressions of homosexuality outside uh, the modern West into four categories. That's transgenerational, transgender, uh, sorry, this is another typo here, class structured, uh, egalitarian, and he matches uh, his Chinese examples uh, to each of the four categories. And this is why I mean, there is still a desire or there's, there's still an assumption that a history of sexual, sexuality is supposed to be a, a kind of sexual ethnography, if not sexology, uh, that we can discover uh, in history. And the reason why we don't always do that is not because we have a uh, sufficient thorough um, reflection on this, this very assumption, but because we don't think we have enough evidence. Now, the next example, uh, uh, my colleague Paul Golden's book, The Culture of Sex in Ancient China. So this is how he defines his subject matter. He says, this book is a study of intellectual concept, conceptions of sex and sexuality in China from roughly 500 BC to 8400. The sources for this book are primarily philosophical, literary, and religious texts. Here he says, this book is not intended as a history of sexuality or sexual behavior. Okay, you see that to our um, put together juxtaposed uh, and uh, he thinks the, ma the material on which it is based sheds very little light on people's sexual practices. Okay, so, so the reason why, why he thinks this book is not about history of sexuality is because we don't have enough evidence about people's sexual practices. And he continues saying historians have begun to question whether any such history can or should be written. Uh, and in any case, for ancient China, the access sources are not sufficiently informative for that purpose. The sources do reveal, however, that Chinese authors wrote earnestly about sexual activity and expected their readers to consider the subject th uh, thoughtfully. Sex sexual intercourse constituted a fundamental source of imagery and terminology that informed the classical Chinese conception uh, of social and political relationships. Actually, to me, this very last sentence, how sexual intercourse uh, constituted a fundamental source of imagery uh, for, that informed people's understanding of social political relations, to me, this is precisely what I think uh, a history of sexuality should seriously engage with. Next example, Susan Men's uh, book, Gender uh, and Sexuality in Modern China. This is also, in, uh, this is uh, unlike uh, Pogonus book, this is more of a introductory uh, survey. And, uh, and it focuses on the modern period of uh, although of course it covers the, uh, the Qing dynasty. 
in the introduction, again, it says, uh, in, in the very beginning, I, I believe it's the opening of the introduction. Uh, it says, does sex have a history? Almost any teenager going with a parent who still lives in the dark age would assure you that it does. But the history of sex is surprisingly difficult to study. Actually, I don't find it that surprised, but uh, <laughs> uh, it's just so, uh, Susan Mann thinks it's surprisingly difficult, but the next author that I'm going to introduce you, he thinks it's not surprising. <laughs> so so he, it's very difficult, why? Because of the lack of evidence. Okay, so this, this is what I've been, um, uh, this kind of uh, repeatedly observed in recent scholarship, uh, that the history of sexuality should be about something and we don't have enough evidence for that something. So we, we move on and study something else. Most people keep their, keep their sex lives to themselves. What people write down, publish, and circulate may be sexual fantasies or invention uh, with plot lines designed to sell copy, which I believe specifically referred to uh, Ming Qing, especially in Ming literature. The evidence can tell us a lot about what people like to read or watch or imagine, but little about what they actually do. So now here is, I, this, this tells us what, uh, uh, perhaps what Susan Mann thinks that what uh, what history of sexuality ideally uh, should be about had we have enough evidence. Ironically, the most reliable evidence for history of sex is the mass material uh, is the mass of material by government officials, religious leaders, parents, doctors, and so on, telling people what not to do. Uh, we can be certain that some people were doing some of that. Um, okay, the next example by Howard Chang. This is in uh, Sexuality in China, uh, that uh, uh, edited volume that Howard Chang uh, edited in the uh, introduction, which is titled Writing the History of Sexuality in China. Uh, here uh, he says, uh, it is not surprising that uh, surviving documentation of human sexual experience from the past is scattered and incomplete. Now, I'm curious why he finds it not surprising, right? Because Susan Mann thinks it's surprising. Uh, he says, when people disclose information about their sexual lives in a factual matter or metaphorically, public record, usually censored, uh, this is what I'm going to uh, uh, connect to my next observation, the censorship hypothesis, usually censored in one way or another, rarely captures the true extent of what happened in the bedroom or elsewhere. Okay? Uh, so this poses significant different degree of methodological difficulty for a study of history of sexuality. Uh, Furthermore, different social groups leave behind the, uh, disproportional measures of historical voice, making it a challenge to deduce broader generation, uh, generalizations about erotic desire and sexual practice in a particular region or a given time period. So the, um, the scholarship that I have shown you, uh, the, the more recent ones, uh, um, not in the same generation of Van Gulik. Uh, everyone's aware of some of the problems in, uh, in, in Van Gulik's work, uh, but the re recent scholarship share kind of the, uh, the, the assumption that, uh, that history of sexuality should uh, first and foremost about a history of people's sexual practice, which is precisely what uh, Van Gulik was looking for as well, except we disagree uh, with Van Gulik that his source can actually tell us anything uh, uh, trustworthy about people's sexual practice. But we don't disagree, uh, not yet, about his, um, his assumption that a history of sexuality should be first and foremost about people's sexual practice. Now I want to move on from here to my second uh, observation that is the censorship hypothesis. That is when we talk about the lack of evidence. Uh, there's some uh, uh, assumption that the reason why we don't have enough evidence is because of some kind of censorship, either uh, politically or ideologically from the government or from uh, uh, the new Confucians, the, the, the easiest uh, um, 
a straw man to uh, to to uh, to call for uh, the source of oppression. And we have seen such narrative in Van Gulik scholarship already, and we still see some of it in recent scholarship, the uh, uh, what I cited earlier, and also uh, in uh, Wei Jing Lu's uh, introduction to uh, this special issue in Journal of the History of Sexuality, uh, focusing on Chinese history. Uh, she cites uh, Van Gulik rather uncritically. And she, writes that Van Gulli attributed the disappearance of these texts, which is the, uh, the, the art of bed chamber texts, the ancient training sexual manuals, to the censorship of new Confucian ideology, which dominated the last centuries of imperial history. He argued that uh, after the 13th century, Confucian Puritanism gradually restricted the circulation of literature of this genre. Now, I am not saying that this is uh, absolutely wrong. I'm not saying that there was no censorship from government or uh, uh, politically or ideologically. But, uh, but the censorship hypothesis uh, obscured many other uh, explanations and some of them even uh, maybe more uh, convincing uh, or more important uh, historical factors or uh, some of the uh, historical factors that's even uh, that we haven't uh, considered enough yet. For example, you know, before, uh, for example, print technology and publishing this, the condition of, of uh, textual circulation, uh, for example, before the uh, you know the revolution uh, narrative, print technology and the emergence of publishing industry, writing was so expensive. And do you really want to use this, for example, this very valuable piece of silk or this super heavy scroll of bamboo strips just to write about how you fold your toilet paper, for example? So you know when we don't see that people talk about something. Uh, that we want them to talk about much enough, maybe it's because the expense <laughs> of them writing about that and all the material resources that I have to gather uh, doesn't uh, kind of outweighs the significance of that subject matter to people's minds, not necessarily there is a government or there is some kind of um, uh, ideological uh, ideology that prevents them from doing that. And second of all, there, there are changing, there's changing population of who, uh, who write and reads. Um, when, uh, when Van Gulli blames the new Confucianism for the disappearing of the uh, ancient sex manuals uh, during, I think particularly the, the Song Dynasty if by Van Gulli's um, uh, uh, periodization. But, uh, you know, we know that the new Confucians never had uh, such a stronghold of the Song society as we previously mentioned. Uh, and also uh, the bedchamber arts, uh, those you know, sexual manuals for uh, uh, people, especially men's bodily cultivation, those uh, technologies or skills were perhaps no longer that relevant to most Song elite people because uh, very few people could still afford such a lavish practice anymore. Um, so there are many possible explanations out there that uh, I think many scholars have considered all I have just said. I'm just uh, 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 repeating some of that because uh, I think there are important factors to consider. And also uh, uh, Zilan Sang in her book, The Emerging Lesbian Female Same-Sex Desire in Modern China has a very uh, insightful uh, explanation to the kind of absence of female-female eroticism in uh, traditional Chinese sources. He says the complete absence of female-female eroticism from traditional Chinese moral and legal codes suggests that it did not constitute a significant source of anxiety for men. Literature further shows that men often trivialize female-female intimacy rather than treating it punitively or prohibiting it. So there's another reason other than censorship is maybe just trivialization is insignificant and it doesn't uh, it, um, 
trigger any anxiety. So, so and, and finally, I want to emphasize the, um, the, uh, the, the epistemology as, uh, as a factor. That is, um, that is if, we are, if we already decide what happened in the bedroom or whatever elsewhere is what we are looking for, then, then maybe it is natural that we see a lack of sources because we don't, um, we don't, we don't see what we wanted to see. And if, if, the, if the sex uh, is taken as a given, then, uh, then, then maybe it's, uh, it's, 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 an, it's natural that we don't see much that we, we wanted to see. Um, and um, so, for example, in my, in my book, um, uh, I, uh, in, well, in the research that I've done in my book, uh, the sources, uh, I think, uh, for example, uh, in the song sources, uh, female sexuality was almost only legible and explicable in relation to men. And that is why, uh, you know, the category of, my category of manless women fell outside of existing epistemology. And you, you cannot easily find them uh, here and there, but, um, but if you change, kind of you, you use a different lens, you may be able to see more and um, may be able to see something else. So with that, I want to move on to my third observation that is, how we have been taken our subject matter as a given. Um, so when we say um, when we say sexuality has a history or sex has a history, we often simply mean that the social institutions and cultural expressions and the practice of something that we already know is sex have histories. We are not thinking about uh, what constitutes sex or the, the changing categories, the way people associate something meaningfully with other things, uh, how that kind of conceptual epistemological framework changed. Uh, there, there, uh, I cannot say all scholarships are, are, are like that, but uh, I think there are still many, many good scholarships. Uh, but uh, when, when we make, gen make generalizations about sex in Chinese history, it often simply means certain sexual activity under a specific conditions. So I want to, again, give you some examples how uh, we use just sex to refer to, uh, we use a general term sex to refer to just uh, actually certain activities, in specific conditions. Which doesn't mean that those scholarships are not valuable, they are valuable in their own rights in different aspects. It's just, uh, I'm, I'm uh, nitpicking <laughs> about the other uh, term sex that's used uh, for my own purposes. So uh, Susan Men's uh, book that I mentioned earlier, uh, she says in, in, in a sentence, I, I will give you the full uh, paragraph of the sentence later, but here in a culture where sex was never coupled with sin, and, and then he, you know, which is in a culture which refers to Chinese culture, in Chinese culture, sex was never coupled with sin, and by sin, he, she's referring to the Christian concept of sin. Now, uh, well, you know, some, but yes, some, yes, th there's nothing uh, if by this, there's nothing that is coupled with the Christian sense of sin in Chinese history because there was no Christian concept of sin in Chinese history. So it's almost like saying nothing. And, uh, but if you are, you want to say that sex was never, uh, all forms of sex was never condemned severely in Chinese history, I think that is an exaggeration because some forms of sex can definitely be severely punished. For example, wife's adultery, a man having sex with the wife of a superior man, etc. It can be severely punished with or without being coupled with the Christian sense of sin. And uh, 
Wei Jing Lu's uh, introduction to the special issue. He mentions uh, the two, there are uh, two major sects of erotica from the Tang Dynasty uh, uh, that uh, I think Yao Ping uh, studies that uh, in detail. Uh, he says the two texts are regarded as manifestations of Tang, Dai, Tang society's openness with regard to sex. Now here is sex two. The two Tang dynasty erotica only manifest Tang society's openness to elite men having sex with those who are not the wives of other elite men. So this is another kind of generalized use of the term sex to, to make us feel like, oh, the Tang society was so open with, to, to sex, but that is not probably the most accurate picture. And uh, Paul Golden's, uh, this is a, also a kind of uh, brief introductory piece that he wrote for uh, the International Encyclopedia of Human Sexuality. He says, sex was usually treated openly uh, in, in ancient China specifically, even by today's standard. Ancient Chinese writers discuss sex seriously as one of the most important topics of human speculation. Now, here again, what he means by sex is also certain forms of sex that were meaningful to ancient Chinese writers. For example, they were not interested in sex between women, <laughs> and they were not interested in, in writing about masturbation. And they were also not interested in writing about bestiality, you know, et cetera. They were interested in a very specific kind of, of sex. For example, uh, in uh, Golden's 2002 monograph, um, he gives a really in interesting example of how, um, how a word uh, term yu is used in referring to both sexual intercourse and, and a, 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 um, uh, imperial uh, action. He says the common word for any kind of action by an emperor with regard to one of his inferior is the same word uh, that was used to describe sexual intercourse with a woman that is yu or drive to drive a chariot. Every sexual, so, and then he gives the, uh, the, the examples. I'm gonna show you one of the primary source that he quotes, it's very fascinating. Uh, and his uh, conclusion here is that every sexual act is thus in some sense a political act, just as every political act in some sense is a sexual act. It's the, I think it's a brilliant observation, uh, except by sex, you know, by the kind of sex that people talk about openly and seriously is only the kind of sex that they deem politically significant or politically ritually significant. So this is the um, uh, one of the, uh, uh, the sources that Paul Golden cites to explain uh, uh, what the word yu means. Here's by um, a uh, Eastern Han writer, Cai Yong. He says, when the son of heaven, the, the emperor, uh, causes to advance is uh, called yu. Yu means to be advanced. Uh, whatever clothing he added on, uh, added to his body, drinking food he brings into his mouth, or consorts and concubines he receives in his bedchamber are all called yu. So this is interesting. Uh, that I want with this quote, I want to move on to to my proposal of what I think hasn't uh, been. Um, uh, uh, attracting enough attention perhaps uh, in the his study of history of sexuality in pre-modern China. That is, um, that is uh, the epistemology in historical context. Um, now I'm listing a few questions. In fact, many scholars uh, have already been asking and answering those questions. What I wanted to emphasize is just to further foreground the importance of those questions and, and to be uh, more aware of the, uh, the, the assumptions that we may have. So uh, the questions such as how the alignment and classification of bodily and affective experiences change over time. And secondly, you know, when we encounter references that speaks sex you know, to, to, to us when we read 
uh, our sources, you know, we encounter something that is, oh, this is uh, talking about, about sex. Maybe we consider that reference in its original context more seriously, and we examine the matters with which that specific reference is associated with. So one of the matters that is matters associated with, it may not be associated with the kind of things that we think it should be associated with. And investigate how and to whom that reference mattered and that whole association and alignment uh, mattered. Uh, for example, the, uh, the previous quote here, um, no. Yes, here. So you see, it, it, is, it is making a really interesting um, association between uh, an emperor's um, sexual relations with his consorts, with the emperor's the relationship with his clothes, and the emperor's relations with, with his food and his drink. I mean, it is not totally unimaginable is that I wouldn't say super foreign to us because this is, I mean, this is what a wealthy, powerful man does <laughs> with his life. Um, but if, if this is the kind of sex that, that people were most interested in talking about, then we need to be aware that, that the, the particular configuration of this particular kind of uh, concept that people are talking about. And there is a power dynamic intrinsically um, in this relationship. And uh, the third question is, is also, was there ever, you know, if, you know, like I said, you know, you, know, you, you have specific kind of sex that's associated with something kind of completely irrelevant to sex, but was there ever uh, maybe an explicit and exclusive category for certain forms of sex in, uh, in pre 20th century Chinese sources. If there is, it would be an interesting uh, event to study. It would be an interesting case to study and when and how certain sexual matters became a unique category. Because, you know, for example, the word yu didn't exclusively mean sex, right? Was there any point? And uh, I'm going to show you a, a chart where uh, this is just a number of terms that we could use in classical Chinese, we see in classical Chinese sources in refer that can refer to, to, to some kind of sex. Yeah? But none of, them, uh, none of them exclusively means sex, right? So if, but no, of course, you know, not having a term doesn't mean not having a concept. So, so if there, I, I wonder if we can think about was there ever uh, a time that would ever a, a, a term ever a concept that emerged at any point that uh, that means exclusively what we would consider sex today then it would be an interesting case to study but uh, I want to uh, go on to um, to so to look at a little bit of this list so if you if we look at this list that we talk about you asked in uh, to drive a, car uh, a chariot and there are the second group of words are a number of rather uh, rather neutral terms that are used to to uh, describe sexual intercourse but again none of them means exclusively sexual intercourse it means intercourse in general intercourse communicate conjoint contact uh, etc in general and the uh, the third one, Xiani, is a uh, is a euphemism, right? It means inappropriately intimate with someone, and it can be appropriate in, in a number of different ways. And there is Jian means illicit. It can be in, uh, illicit sex in illicit uh, other things. Uh, there's Luan and there's Yin. Uh, so if, ba if just based on those terms, you we see that the reference to sex is always very, very contextual. You have to have a whole sentence, if not a whole passage to figure out, oh, this, they are talking about sex. So a sexual reference was not always, or was rarely distinguished in nature from uh, other, from non-sexual matters. So if, if that's the case, then, then, um, then, then what do we do? And, um, what do we do with our sources? So I want to go back to, uh, to this uh, passage that, that I just showed you, which uh, Pogonen translates uh, this passage by Cai Yong. 
I want to say a little bit of my my reading of it. That is, you see here, it's it's it denotes a very it describes a very specific relation between a supreme man and his subjects. And uh, at least in this passage, we see there's no real distinction is made between clothing, food and drink, and consorts in relation to an emperor. But I think this is not about, this is not a, a passage that says something about sex as a basic human needs, just like food and clothes. This is not my reading of this passage. My reading of this passage is that it's about what makes an emperor emperor. So it's about the political, ritual, and physical significance of an emperor's intercourse with his consort that is fundamentally different from an ordinary person. So that is why I think to, to more specifically define and to be more aware of uh, the term sex that we're using as not a generalized term is important because I think it, avails those nuances that we can perhaps see in a text like this. And also uh, we know that for those of, of us who uh, have read some of those uh, ancient Chinese erotica or uh, the bed chamber arts manuals, we also recognize this word yu because it's often used in the bed chamber manuals. And uh, so, which, you know, it's a common terminology used in bed chamber manuals, uh, which also tells us, echoes what, you know, scholars like uh, Charlotte Firth have, have uh, uh, noticed, have points out. It's the sexual, the bed chamber manuals, they were ultimately about how to make a man a supreme man, uh, spiritually, physically, ritually. And we rarely see this term actually outside of the imperial context or outside of those ancient bedchamber arts with, for, some, for, for uh, good reason. And the, uh, the second uh, uh, passage that I show you here is uh, another interesting example that uh, associates uh, sex with, or some kind of sex with something very, very different. Uh, that's uh, this 13th century Taoist priest, uh, Wang Xichao's. This is in his uh, annotation to an early Bingbao scripture. The title of the text is very, very long, so I'm just going to skip here. It's Dong Xuan Ling Bao Zi Ran Jiu Tian Sheng Shen Yu Zhang Jing Jie. Now, it's, the title is not important, it's a 13th century Taoist text. Uh, it talks about the kind of eight leagues that a Taoist practitioner should avoid during their thousand day long fast. He says, the, uh, the uh, your tears would leak uh, the liver or leak the, uh, the qi, the energy of your liver. Your nasal uh, mucus leaks the lungs, saliva leaks the kidneys, uh, sweat leaks the hearts, night, night sweat uh, leaks the small intestines, uh, it's the, the energy of the sweat intestines. Uh, drooling during sleep, which I believe we all do, leaks the brain. Dreaming of intercourse with ghosts leaks uh, the shen spirit. Lust, if you see the original Chinese is yin yu, uh, and yin with a, 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 with a woman, a radical suggesting kind of having sex with women, uh, leaks the body. Now, so, I um, I also discussed this uh, passage in my in my uh, book as well. So my reading is that the problem, uh, you know, you, you see that uh, the kind of sexual matters uh, or problem of sex, dreaming you know, with ghosts and lust, or just ordinary sex with women, are associated with other rather ordinary bodily functions. You have tears and nasal muscles, and you couldn't help drooling during your sleep and you sweat, etc. So, so the problem here is not, it's not being, uh, it's not doing anything unusual or excessive or superfluous. The problem here is precisely and simply being ordinary. So with this, I want to move on to my second set of questions. That is, uh, that is how do we do comparative history? How was pre-modern China different or not? 
uh, with this and the problem of being ordinary in mind. So the second set of questions starts with what, what matters to us and why. And that is why I think uh, comparative history uh, is important to us, or in a sense, we all do some kind of comparative history. And I think it is what matters to us and why is an important question that we need to con continuously ask ourselves before asking how was China different or similar? Now, we often hear historians, uh, uh, especially historians of non or Western cultures, say that we need to understand something uh, in Chinese history, for example, in its own right. Okay, but, but I think it is naive to think that we can already readily, we can readily understand anything in its own right without, no, without beating us to death. <laughs> so it's, it's not easy and it's not, um, it's not uh, a one click away um, thing. And I also think that compare, uh, contemporary, uh, our um, right now, the present concerns are important not just because uh, our contemporary present concerns keeps historical study relevant, but also because we are all actually, we're all constantly making comparisons with our own society, our own culture. Uh, uh, we, we are constantly making comparisons between our, the society or culture that we're more familiar with and the historical subject that we study with or without ourselves recognizing it. So our own world of epistemology is always the reference point from which we understand and describe our historical subject. So in a sense, all of us are doing comparative history already with or without ourselves recognizing uh, that we are doing it. So I want to show some uh, examples of uh, the kind of comparisons more obvious comparisons that we see in the scholarship of Chinese history of sexuality before I come back to, to, uh, to more on this. So again, the, the, the best example is always the things that we already kind of all have consensus uh, on. So, uh, so we've seen how Joseph Nikon and uh, Arish and Gulick as is convinced by Joseph Ninham, Chinese sexology uh, was in comparison with other Asians and with the rest of the world. Um, and uh, the and there's uh, Michael Foucault's uh, uh, contrast uh, between China and maybe the rest of the world is also interesting. He has the scheme of uh, scientia sexualis versus arts erotica, or sexual science versus uh, erotic arts. Uh, it's uh, so we th there's a lot of criticisms uh, of this distinction between scientia sexualis and arts erotica that that I won't re repeat here. But um, but if you read Leon Rocha's <laughs> the uh, article that. Uh, that I cite here, uh, he he very um, um, uh, he summarizes all the critiques really really well. Uh, but I want to quote. Uh, I want to use uh, his um, uh, uh, research here. Uh, he quotes a uh, uh, Foucault's interview with uh, Hubert Dreyfus that he says, you know, in, in so in. Foucault's History of Sexuality, Volume One. Uh, at first, he uh, Foucault says, "Okay, um, uh, Sanchez sexualist is the uh, the kind of modern world, uh, whereas in ancient Greece, ancient Rome, and ancient whatever culture, there's only uh, R.C. Radica." But then, when he he later he does interviews, and he also kind of changed uh, his mind. Um, because he thinks that you know you can uh, you can still um, uh, get pleasure from uh, from doing science sexualist. Anyway, so in this interview, 
uh, he says, well, you know, the Greeks and Romans, they did not have any RC relica to be compared with the Chinese RC relica. So the ancient Chinese, the ultimate uh, RC relica compared to the rest of the world. Uh, Chinese formula would be uh, plaisir, desire, act, uh, pleasure, desire, act. X are put aside because you have to restrain X in order to gain the maximum duration and intensity of desire. Uh, whereas the Christian formula puts an accent on desire and tries to eradicate it. Now, uh, if you read, uh, so according to Leon Rocha's uh, research, this under course understanding of Chinese art Siraha basically comes from Bengalic. So this is so you know Bengalic is the source of uh, imagination of ancient China as a world of art Siraha. So uh, Leon Rocha says, you no, know, of course, admits that he has made a mistake in the history of sexuality, volume one, about the distinction between Sanisha sexualism and art Siraha, but nonetheless insists that China has an art Siraha. <laughs> um, he get that information from uh, from Bengalic. Now, uh, now historians of China, we have all accepted that uh, Bengalic uh, uh, is kind of an orientalist, <laughs> or you know, we don't say sex in ancient China was healthy or normal anymore, and we don't tend to use uh, RC radical to, to describe uh, China versus um, other cultures. Um, but some of us. But so after Van Gulik, okay, after we realized or after we have the critique of Van Gulik, what we set off doing after that was that some of us, I think we started to, to make another kind of contrast that China and maybe the West uh, are still different. They're just in different ways. Others try to prove that uh, with various source, uh, evidence, that China also had something similar to uh, Sayansha sexualism, something similar to uh, the uh, the project of sexual science. Now I'll give you examples of both. So the first one, uh, how scholars set off uh, making other kind of comparisons. Two examples. One again is Susan Mann. Mm. She says, uh, in a culture where this is that I quoted here, I give you the whole passage, uh, in a culture where, uh, in which sex was never coupled with a scene in which Adam and Eve had no role in the cultural or historical explanations for sexual desire and its consequences. The Chinese conviction that, the sexual, act, that sexual activity is an essential part of healthy, well, we still use <laughs> healthy, uh, human life softened and diffused the conflicts about homoerotic desire and about homosexual and transgender identities that feed homophobia and even violence in many modern cultures. Now, we can see clearly what Susan Mann has in mind and, and we know what she cares about, which is the same thing that I care about. But, uh, but what I wanted to ask beyond you know, what I just when I talk about, you know, there was basically nothing that was coupled with the Christian concept of sin in ancient China anyway. But what I also wanted to ask is that, is in fact, uh, homophobia in modern society is really just or mainly a result of the Christian concept of sin? Are we simplifying uh, the homophobic society, uh, this kind of uh, Christian society, uh, a little bit when we are making this comparison. Are we not complicating uh, both parties that we compare, uh, but instead we kind of simplify it? Now, uh, and, and kind of similarly, uh, Paul Golden uh, in his uh, 2015 article, he says there's a, a section is this title uh, in this article is the section title is no Christian concept of sin. Uh, specific in ancient China, he says, um, sex was not regarded as inherently shameful. To be sure, various powers, uh, political, religious, uh, social, everything, sought to limit the permissible partners and locations for sexual intercourse. Uh, 
So for example, you know, you cannot have sex with like specific kind of uh, people, or you cannot have sex in sp specific locations. Uh, but sexuality, especially if not immoderate or in, was never laden with anything like a Christian concept of sin. Now, I don't, uh, I don't disagree with, uh, with Golden's statement, but, uh, but I have a few uh, thoughts. Number one, if by this standard, maybe nothing was inherently shameful, it's always contextual. It's always about the, uh, the partners, always about the locations, always about the context. Nothing was inherently shameful. Uh, number two, there were, uh, or there are still many different interpretations of sin in the Christian tradition. So again, I think similar to Susan Mann's case, are we simplifying um, uh, the Christian tradition uh, simply because we, we use that just as an easy reference point? Number three, if sex was not a distinct or and, and a neutral category in ancient China, how could it ever be inherently anything? Right? So I don't, I don't disagree with, uh, I also don't disagree with uh, Paul Golden, also especially because his subject is ancient China and it was before Buddhism came in and before, uh, uh, before uh, Taoism incorporated a lot of Buddhist elements, et cetera. But uh, in, in some Taoist texts or you know, the texts that were attributed to Taoist authors, um, such as the one that I showed you before, desire was inherently dangerous and destructive. And it was not excessive or inappropriate desire. It was desire itself. So if you go back to this uh, passage that I showed you before, this is uh, one example. What I mean, that the problem of being ordinary and practitioners aim for the extraordinary. And uh, a few other examples, uh, they are actually from the kind of bedchamber arts tradition that are either attributed to Taoist authors or they were uh, written by Taoist authors. Uh, the, the first uh, example is from uh, Yang Xin Yan Ming Lu, it's attributed to Tao Hong Jing and it was uh, probably written between the seventh to mid eighth century. Uh, so there's a passage that says, pre men separate beds from women. <laughs> Mediocre men use a different blanket from women. Sleeping alone is more beneficial than taking a thousand doses of medicine. So, so, so you see the, the hierarchy is very, very clear. Well, yes, it doesn't say that having sex is shameful, but having sex with women, sleeping with women is fundamentally problematic. And Sun Simiao, this uh, seventh century Taoist and medical writer, his answer to if this passage was in fact written by him, he could also be just incorporating a passage from elsewhere. But uh, the answer to whether men uh, below the age of 60 should refrain from ejaculation, uh, his answer is no, they shouldn't. Um, and he says, well, it would be the best actually if your mind is perfectly just and you have no uh, sexual thoughts at all. Uh, and yet there is not one such person even among 10,000. Uh, and uh, if you forcefully withhold and close up the gene or the essence of the semen, uh, it is difficult to maintain and it's easy to fall, uh, to fail. It causes men to leak gene uh, and to have turbid urine leading to the illness of intercourse with ghosts. The damage out of one such case equals a hundred regular ejaculations. Now, my reading of this passage in Sun Simiao's um, text is not a narrative about uh, oppression versus uh, liberation. It's not about um, uh, pathology versus healthy. It's, but it's more about uh, the ordinary and the extraordinary. So he's teaching the ordinary people uh, a compromise to keep them from dying too fast. So desire or sex itself 
leads you to death fundamentally. So it may not be a shame, it may not be a sin, but you die out of having sex. Um, I also kind of promised to say something about Juicy in my abstract, but I'm going to skip. If we are interested, we can come back here. So I uh, want to go to uh, the second, the, the other uh, kind of approach after Van Gulik, that is, you know, to try to say that there was actually something similar to uh, a sexual science um, in, in, in traditional China. Um, so, uh, so for uh, for example, uh, Charlotte Furth in his in her uh, really important article. This is through her article rethinking Mangolik. We realize a lot of questions in Mangolik that we didn't before. Uh, she says the bed chamber manuals or the so called Chinese ancient Chinese arts erotica were not about pleasure, uh, which was. Foucault's uh, idea of what R.C. Rock is supposed to be about, but they were concerned with the regulation of reproduction and the distinction of sexual difference. And the sexual difference was constructed around contrast in powers of control. So you need to know if a woman is enjoying the process, you need to pay attention to women's reaction because you want to control the whole process. And that is the major gender difference here. Now, so in that sense, this, the whole scheme of, of uh, bed chamber arts manuals, they were not that different from the aims of uh, the so-called scientia sexualis, because that is precisely what sexual science was trying to do. And uh, in her book, A Flourishing in Gender in China's Medical History, when uh, discussing Song Dynasty medicine, he, she makes this generalization uh, saying uh, the woman's sexual body was not separated from her generative and gestational body and desire in both sexes was naturalized as a manifestation of the intentionality of heaven and earth or the, the nature, the cosmos, rather than psychologized as uh, erotic pleasure. Again, erotic pleasure refers to this kind of course idea of RC erotica. So here, uh, first, he's also trying to argue that there really wasn't about R.C. Radaka in China. And in fact, if you look at the way that medical texts trying to regulate reproduction and emphasize and construct sexual difference, it's really more similar to, um, to sexual science. Now I have I have some response and some of my uh, uh, revisions to this uh, observation in my book, so I won't uh, I won't uh, eva uh, uh, I will I will skip that. Uh, but after seeing the both both uh, approaches, I want to bring in uh, Leon Rocha's um, conclusion in in this article, Sensha Sexualist versus R. C. Radha Foucault, Van Gulik and Needham. Which is a really, um, uh, really uh, uh, enlightening uh, um, paragraph in his uh, in his conclusion. He says um, so. He's talking about uh, this so-called uh, scenography project, scenography, as in um, uh, scenology. We look at the, the tradition of sinology as a historiography, so sinography project, and it's trying to understand the kind of intellectual dynamics in, in the history of sinology, uh, which uh, in this particular, how assumptions concerning the essential features of Chinese civilization precede the act of producing knowledge about China. So in figuring out whether China is similar or different from the West, we have often already decided that China is similar or different from the West. We set out um, trying to prove what we already uh, believe in. So now what, right? So, now, so I wanna come back, so this is my last slide. I wanna to come to my uh, conclusion. So what's the point, right, of still making comparisons if we tend to uh, set off uh, already deciding uh, if we want to argue difference or similarity? Now, um, if uh, I think, uh, you know, if one culture is not always uh, 
it would it would be uh, productive if one culture is not always the reference point of the other. Okay, and that is not to pretend that we can easily study something in its own right, but to co continuously destabilize and unfamiliarize uh, both, if not multiple, uh, of our reference points and, and the subject matter. For example, when, uh, when uh, people make the comment or the observation that there's no Christian concept of sin in China, so there was less homophobia in China. Now, I would then, I would then ask, uh, not simply, okay, really, was there really no homophobia? There was really less homophobia in China. I would also ask, is the Christian concept of sin the true and main reason for homophobia? Then we can ask more questions to, to uh, uh, both of our reference points and our subject of comparison. So, that is to uh, that is what I mean by unfamiliarize uh, uh, to recognize our own epistemology and concerns and uh, and unfamiliarize ourselves and historical subjects and uh, and uh, as I said earlier, I don't think anyone can get out of comparative history because even if we are not comparing, say, medieval China with medieval Europe or modern China with modern India, or I don't know, uh, Han dynasty versus Roman empire, even if we're not doing that, we're always uh, consciously or not comparing historical subjects with our own world. So we have to persistently unfamiliarize both, uh, unfamiliarize both our historical subjects and ourselves. And from this angle, I think uh, from Joseph Needham, from Robert Hans Van Gulick to, uh, to Schauer first and to all the scholarship that I mentioned above are, are still really valuable because they are all part of this continuous effort of destabilizing and unfamiliarizing ourselves and our historical subjects. And I wanted to end by, uh, by uh, urging uh, or encouraging um, if we have any non-China historians, especially uh, non-Asian uh, historians of sexuality to read more about Chinese history because this cannot be done just by um, people who are doing Chinese history trying to read more about uh, you know, um, uh, non-China studies and trying to, to unfamiliarize ourselves and, and to make uh, reference point to make comparison. I think it would also be helpful, for example, it would really need a specialist of, of um, Christianity, history of Christianity, etc., to answer the question if the Christian concept of sin really was the main reason for homophobia. So I think it takes both ways. So I think it would really be helpful uh, and productive if non-China specialists, non-Asian specialists can um, be interested to reading more about Chinese history. Okay, I will and um, my uh, presentation here, and I, uh, I, I look forward to the questions. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful talk. Um, I know that we can't really applaud on Zoom, especially when people are invisible, but uh, please imagine um, enthousi an enthusiastic response. Um, and now I guess I'd like to invite people to either, I think we could see, we can see people raising hands if they'd like to ask questions, or if you'd be more, and if you raise your hand, I will um, go ahead and like uh, allow you to talk. Um, but we also have, if you'd prefer to use the uh, Q&A or the chat, um, we can then respond and read those questions out. Um, so as people, um, I guess, you know, sort of collect their thoughts up after this, I, I thought maybe I'd begin with a, a question. And this goes back to that quotation that you, you came back to from Wang Xichao um, about where, you know, the, the leakages, right? And so the first six of those leak leakages are pretty obviously physical, right? It's saliva or mucus mm -hmm. and so forth um, being produced, you know, leaks the, the brain, like the saliva leaks the brain, right? Um, and those last two, I would say, are essentially mental, right? Like lust is not a, a kind of physical thing. So I'm wondering, and I was that caused me to sort of look as you were going through the quotations about this kind of balance between um, the mental act of sex, right? Like the lust and lust 
thoughtful thoughts yeah. versus mm. the actual physical act of it. And mm. I'm wondering if you can say, you know, a little bit about how these fit together, right? Because we could imagine that that you could talk about sex as being both of those things, but also perhaps just you could separate them and talk about them as like a mental act, but also just a purely mm -hmm. physical act. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can, I can share the slides again so that people have the reference. Uh, yeah, so, um, so it's a, yeah, it's a great question. I didn't, um, I didn't quite notice that when I, uh, when I read it. Uh, and now when you say it, it makes a lot of sense. And, um, and, uh, and when it, yeah, when it talks about dream of universe with, that, with ghosts and talks about the leaking of Shen, right? And so that is definitely at a different level. Well, we won't say it's not physical, but it's at a different level from the kind of ordinary um, body that we can, you can see and touch. And with the uh, with lust or in you, uh, it's, it leaks the body, but then again, in you is desire. Right. Uh, so, yeah. So that's 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 really interesting. And um, and I wonder. Yes, maybe Natasha. Maybe you discover a part where where people does you know, put put some sex in some kind of different ways. Uh, some kind of different uh, category from not not completely different, but then there is some uh, something specific about the kind of mental obsession or kind of mental. Um, Concerns that pours into that has uh, a major physical reaction because uh, the uh, uh, the result of loss is shen uh, lo right? It's leaks of the body has it's a it's a mental it's a desire it's a mental function that has severe physical uh, outcome, and um, so so yeah, it's I think it's, it's a great observation and. Uh, and there is um, there is similar uh, discussion actually about desire in medical books as well. The way they talk about uh, they talk about sex or talk about sexual desire, about how how, how exhausting uh, sexual desire can be. Maybe all kinds of desire, but then sexual desire tends to be the worst. <laughs> so. Um, so there, there is, there is definitely, uh, there is definitely that in, in uh, I believe in the Buddhist tradition as well, in Taoist uh, scriptures and in the medical text, it talks about how I think this what I referring to specifically is the part um, about uh, I think that's in Song, in the Song Dynasty medical like large uh, medical compilation in the Northern Song, and it talks about. Uh, it, it compares uh, women uh, and women uh, who are sexually active with men and women who are not. And it says, okay, women who uh, who have married and have, have a husband, uh, their body would tend to be damaged through, um, through uh, getting pregnant and giving birth to children. That's how their bodies would tend to be damaged. Um, uh, and whereas uh, women who uh, not married and not sexually active with men, their body can be damaged uh, uh, by the uh, the thoughts of desire. So um, so yeah, so there is there is um, uh, similar ideas in metal test and 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 yes, this is a great observation. Thank you, Natasha. There's a question in the chat. I I think perhaps you can open that. Um, and the, yeah, I see this is very li much linked to nature as they are the same word, at least in the 20th century. This is from, uh, and so when you talk about the historical concept, is this very close to the div man with discourse of man woman division in society? Um, it's a relational gendered concept. It, is this right? Um, nature, there was, I believe there was not. Uh, the same concept of nature as uh, in modern post 19th century sense in China, just like uh, there was not the same kind of uh, sense of nature in pre 19th century uh, Europe or elsewhere in the world. That is, um, that is to, 
um, to imagine, or maybe I shouldn't say that, but <laughs> maybe there was, which is not a mainstream, or maybe we were not quite hearing it. But um, then I would say uh, it, there was not a mainstream uh, notion of nature as as uh, how it means to us, uh, as you know, nature as a um, a completely mechanical, neutral, uh, objective subject out there, and um, when uh, you know when we make um, observations uh, of say you know right now when we say oh something's natural or unnatural our uh, assessment a lot of times is based on this kind of quantitative uh, assessment. For example, well, well, I do a survey and uh, I do um, uh, examination among 100 people, uh, 80 out of 100 people likes to have sex with the same sex. Then same sex is homosexuality is actually natural because 80 people out of 100 thinks that they wouldn't mind having sex with the same sex. Um, I think this is this tend to be what we mean by natural. Uh, but this was never the case in in uh, in traditional China, or I don't believe is ever uh, uh, the main case in, in pre 19th century um, Europe. Uh, in the source that we've seen, it's not about survey, it's not about statistics, it's not about what the majority of people do, which represents a norm uh, as in the statistical or quantitative sense. It's always, almost always a, a qualitative sense. It's always, you know, even if, uh, even if only a thousand, one among, among a thousand, or not even one among 10,000 uh, can, can do without uh, sexual desire, it's still the only way around. It is still the only way to be to be liberated. Uh, only if you can get away with your sexuality. I I I, I hope I answer your your question, right? So it is really not about nature as in our modern sense. <clears throat> and um, so, mm -hmm. so I see um, Sume E has her hand up. Um, I'm going to allow her to talk and ask or uh, allow Sume to ask her a question. Uh, hi, um, hi, uh, hi, 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 um, hi, I, I, thanks for giving uh, us uh, such a wonderful um, lecture or, you know, talk. Uh, my question is, uh, I'm, I'm particularly interested in song history, so I'm, uh, I agree with you that, um, you know, that like in China, the um, men with, um, with, with lower social status, uh, if had if he has had a sexual relationship with uh, women uh, from higher social um, class, uh, it would, would be uh, punished. He would be punished harshly and also the, 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 the lady. So, um, so there was something, uh, you know, uh, about, um, you know, saying like stuff uh, in, in, in Chinese uh, sexuality. Um, I'm wondering what what happened from you know from Tai Yong's time to the Song time. I mean, in Tai Yong's time, you know, like the emperor can drive or you know, you uh, many many women. Um, so and we also have many stories, uh, anecdotes about um, uh, men had sex with uh, you know the transcendence or you know the uh, um, how do you say, uh, uh, and mm -hmm. the, the, the transcendence, females transcendence, uh, gave the men everything they desire. But this kind of uh, story is kind of, I feel, I have the impression they are disappearing in, in the time period, it was in, in the Song Dynasty, like in the Yi Jian Zhi, very few stories about, you know, you know, in intercourse ways, uh, you know, uh, transcend female transcendence bring out bring about good uh, endings. They were always, you know, like uh, Wang Xi's house, uh, uh, like eight leaks. You know, always brought um, bad things towards men. So is that something related to you know, um, 
So, I mean, what, what's the relation, what's the significance of class or the Chinese view of class in this transition or in the comparative view of, you know, China and Europe? Um, like in Christian uh, terminology, when we talk about the thing, it's more about spiritually, uh, spiritual life instead of um, class or social, you know, everyone is kind of equal in front, you know, um, principally in front of God, uh, but in Chinese um, background, um, it's, it's not, right? The emperor can, can use women, but not ordinary people, uh, men allowed to do that, you know, what, do you know what I'm talking mm, about? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah I, I should stop there. I'm kind of losing. <laughs> no, I get it. I get you, Sumi. Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I agree with you that class played a important role. I think in some of the uh, the changes that we observe in our sources from uh, from ancient to to the Song periods. Um, and uh, one example that I would uh, totally agree with you how how much uh, the changing social structure uh, changed the. the uh, changed what we see in this or that time period is that we don't we, we don't we don't see very much uh, uh, arts of bed, bed chamber uh, literature from the song anymore right and then Gulick's explanation would be they were oppressed by the new Confucians and and we all disagree right and and um, uh, and I think uh, my, uh, my my guess is not a result of serious study, but my guess is you know, the reason or a part of the reason why uh, art of uh, bedchamber arts manuals disappeared from the song was just because it wasn't, uh, people could not afford that anymore. And even even um, even higher class management richer uh, people, they, they couldn't quite afford that anymore. And for even for people uh, with better off uh, families, they had they, they had to to um, uh, plan every single marriage uh, very strategically to make sure that their family influence can perpetuate. It was a very uh, it was a much more uh, precarious time for the elites in the Song than in uh, perhaps in the Tang and the Han uh, period. So, so uh, you know the kind of lavishness uh, that you can you can exploit uh, female bodies out there um, is was uh, not quite much there uh, anymore in the Song. But uh, but we do see uh, that. Um, the number of consorts that, or the number of concubines that you are allowed to have, uh, still uh, still indicates your your status, right? Uh, or uh, especially in the song, right? Um, so I think um, you know Patricia Ibri has an article about why there are so many uh, women in the in the imperial harem during the the Song Dynasty, <laughs> and. Um, Part of it was actually because most of the women are the previous emperor's consorts and they just stay there. It's not that they are also the, the wives and consorts of the present uh, emperor. <laughs> they are just widows, uh, uh, widow consorts from the past. And also the other reason was also, it was an indication of the emperor's status. So in a sense, I think the fact that consorts, relation of consorts uh, makes is part of what makes an emperor emperor, what makes a supreme a supreme, is still there, except uh, the the kind of uh, the kind of physical spiritual ritual practice of bedchamber uh, arts was no longer uh, uh, no longer uh, pragmatic for for people in the song. So 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 I. I, I think a lot happened uh, between uh, Cai Yong's time and the Song, and and uh, the changing structure um, class uh, definitely played a, a, a important role, which I think we should you know uh, pay much more attention uh, to than simply 
simply resort to uh, new Confucianism or the lack of Christian content seen as an explanation to those uh, phenomena. And uh, with regard to, to their fewer uh, references of men having um, sexual relations with those female goddesses, I think I might have some answer in my book, but I cannot remember it right now. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but let me let me let me think about it. But uh, but I think there yeah there there uh, definitely is an interesting question. There is uh, there must be some answers uh, out there. Yeah, yeah, I should read your book again. <laughs> <laughs> let, let let me think about what I wrote. <laughs> So I see three questions out there. Um, one is in the Q&A and then two people have their hands raised and we were supposed to have a, you know, the scheduled to 430. I think we could take these three questions probably. Um, and then, you know, but no, no more beyond that. Um, so in the Q&A, uh, Yutong Lee asks or notes that the Taoist text talks about um, dreaming about sexual discourse, intercourse is harmful to one's body. Um, and this is similar to Ming Qing literature fe featuring intimate encounters between literati men and female ghosts in a dream. Um, how do you analyze the popularity of this plot supposedly harmful to the male male's bodies in literature? How do I, how do I analyze the popularity of this part in, in Ming Qing literature? Uh, that would uh, that would need a Ming Qing specialist. Uh, but let me see. <laughs> What I can do, um, I, um, I think, yes, I think a mentioning uh, specialist will have a really great answer. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Keith McMahon, uh, Sophie Wong will have great, great, ans great answers to that. But um, I wanted to say, what I wanted to say is that uh, my understanding of the uh, stories about elite men having a uh, erratic encounter with female ghosts. It has a lot to do with the identity of the, fe of the uh, female partner that they encounter. Um, it would be a completely different story if they encounter, say, a female goddess or uh, a legitimate uh, uh, wife or um, et cetera. But that's not what I see in some of the Taoist texts, not all of the Taoist, but some of the Taoist texts that I, that I, that I uh, wanted to emphasize here. It is, it, is not about, it is not about the partners. It is not about the location. It is not about uh, the, uh, the extent to which you, you do it. It is about, it is about, um, it, it is about desire itself. And um, so it is about the the act of of uh, of your desire itself, and so so that I think is quite quite distinct, and that is why I think uh, we ought to think again uh, before we make a quick conclusion saying, oh, uh, you know, the tr traditional Chinese world is much more tolerant <laughs> to sex as opposed to the Christian world, because no, it's not a shame, it's not a sin, no, but just being ordinary is a problem. And, um, uh, and so, so that's why I think, uh, I think uh, it's, it's quite distinctive. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to unmute Elena um, for her question. Hi, hi. Hi, Elena. Uh, nice, a wonderful talk. I was a little late, so I don't know if my Thank question you. will be relevant or not. But anyways, I wanted to follow up on this um, idea of ordinary ordinary versus extraordinary. And um, uh, so you were, uh, you were talking about uh, these Taoist uh, writers and how they, uh, uh, that one specific example, but but I, I know you have many more um, about how um, sex is not indicated and desire, as you just mentioned, even desire is not indicated if you want to be uh, become an immortal. And so, um, and so this is like the extraordinary way that the Taoist uh, practitioner wants to follow. But I'm interested also in you maybe talking a little bit about the ordinary. So what, um, 
what what is the difference there? Uh, you know, do in medical literature, for example, when when it, when sex is discussed or even desire is discussed, is there a difference? Because of course, not very many people were Taoists who practice these uh, practice extraordinary practices to become immortals and therefore uh, try to not uh, desire. Uh, uh, or not have sex. So mm -hmm. what, what about ordinary people? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, thank you, Elena, for the question. And now as I listen to your question, I think I should revise some of what I just said. Um, uh, that is, um, maybe in a sense, we can still say, um, uh, at least based on those uh, those texts that I just quote, or uh, some of the medical texts that I quote, uh, some uh, some Chinese traditions, uh, at least if we just look at the intellectual uh, world itself, maybe are indeed quite tolerant <laughs> to people's, to, um, uh, to, to uh, having sex, to have sexual desires and uh, in specific ways, because, uh, because indeed um, uh, Taoism did not, did not expect everyone to be extraordinary it promised that it kind of have some kind of promise sets the standard it, it, indeed it doesn't doesn't expect everyone to be extraordinary and in fact it, it gives different uh, recipes different, different solutions uh, give this compromise solutions for people who are not extraordinary who bound to be <laughs> bound to be ordinary and they give you the solutions that that uh, that you can still do a little bit better. You are not going to become immortal, but then you are going to die. You're not going to die uh, too soon. So 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 in that sense, uh, yes, maybe we can say um, it is still uh, quite tolerant uh, in that in that sense. And so when it comes to medicine, uh, there are there are interesting. There are interesting different ways of, of looking at desire in, in medical texts uh, that in the medical texts that I uh, that I've uh, read. Uh, some of them actually, I think most of them, most of the medical texts from the Song uh, were not that interested in desire per se, actually. Uh, some of them were. And for those that uh, that specifically discuss desire had a lot to do, a lot of them had a lot to do with, you see a very clear uh, uh, Buddhist connotation in it, you know, how much desire exhausts you and how much that kind of distracts you and etc. It was a, a quite clear uh, kind of Buddhist connotation in some of the soul medical texts that um, place some emphasis on desire. And many of them simply don't play that much uh, emphasis on desire if compared, especially with, uh, Ming-Qing medical texts. So there's a huge emphasis on, on desire, especially female desire in, in the Ming-Qing text, which, which is a really interesting um, uh, transition that I think a lot of, uh, a lot of scholars have, have noticed. So, um, uh, so yes, so and when some medical texts talk about desire, it is in a very similar way to uh, to uh, the Taoist text that I just mentioned. You know, they talk about desire in general and they talk about uh, the problem of desire in itself. It's not quite about you know, excessive desire or you know, inappropriate desire or specific form of desire. It talks about the problem of desire in general and in itself. Uh, so that's kind of my current observation of, of some medical texts. So our final question will be from uh, Fred Damon. I'm unmuting you. Oh, okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, great. I really love the talk. Um, my, uh, I have more comments than questions and they probably would require a long discussion. So I'll just sort of put them on the table and let you think about them. The first one was, is, they're both comparative. The first one is historical. With the 13th century quote about the leakage business, what came to my mind was 19th century England and the United States, where the problem of sexuality was losing powers and trying to focus powers into the right things, which were then were work, was work. And I know there are actually similar conceptions in um, India, and I'm wondering if that leakage thing is a problem mm -hmm. 
array in powers correctly. The yeah. the other thing was um, the 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 word you. Uh, I quickly looked it up in some of my uh, electronic dictionaries while you were talking, and uh, in addition to drive, the word manage came. And that was very striking to me because I do research in the South Pacific, and for some years I've been thinking about the symbolic and other relationships or equivalences between boats where I do my research and the image of a carriage in China, and actually now a car. And the, the boats where I do my research are full of what in a sort of Freudian sense you would think with all kinds of sexual things. But that isn't actually what my folks think about it. Um, you know, for them, it's really a kind of efficacy and, comp and competence in, in which getting male and female parts together appropriately is a condition for actually sailing correctly. Mm -hmm. And for a person who's the captain of the boat, their being able to manage those different forces is, uh, again, a test of his efficacy and, in a sense, management. So the, the word that you gave out to us, you, was really resonant with all kinds of similar sorts of things. Anyway, I'll leave it there. I don't know if you want to comment on that or not or think about it in the future. I loved your talk, though. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. Um, yeah, I... Um... I think we would need a more um, somebody who's uh, uh, more trained in heart theory to to to, to really decipher whether uh, how this uh, riding a chariot or uh, driving a chariot uh, metaphor in ancient China how Freudian it is or how not it is. But um, but I think what I get is that I think what we tend to take from uh, from Freud is how everything is sexual. Uh, we, 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 don't, we don't do it the other way around. Uh, we, we tend not to think how everything that we think is sexual is not just, it's not that sexual. So we can take this other way around. You know, if, so what Paul Golden says, you know, every sexual act is a political act, every political act is a sexual act. We, we take it both ways if we do that. So yes, every political act is a sexual act, but, uh, but every sexual act is not just sexual ad it is also something else and um and and that is another direction that we can we can take as well i'm not sure if if uh if freud is uh is very much sent everything centered around sex or it goes you know many many different directions um because that's how kind of how i perceive uh the uh driving the chariot uh imagery i would agree with you on that mm -hmm. So we're now well over time, and I don't want to uh, uh, delay you or take up too much more of your time and energy on this Friday afternoon. Um, but uh, let us all virtually thank um, Professor Chung for an excellent talk and a really robust discussion uh, of uh, these issues of sexuality and how we should think about studying them in different times and different places. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Natasha. Uh, thank you for all your questions and comments. I really, really, uh, really appreciate them. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.